and i'm hoping that maybe by the end of this talk i'm able to transmit a little bit of that excitement to all of you uh, i'll be talking about habitat and wildlife diversity in india of course one cannot cover all of this in a short period of time but i'm trying my best to include a little bit of everything here and i i just want to you know mention before i start that the first ever trekking expedition that i had was with dr rita and dr anjali and you know over two decades have passed and every day of that trek uh, is you know still very i have a very vivid memory of it till date because that is what experiences in nature can do to you and you know i thank uh, i have uh, dr rita to thank for that as well because that was definitely one of the most exciting experiences as uh, you know a person who was just out of school at you know who had this absolute wonderful experience in wilderness so on that thought uh i am going to start with the talk i've sort of structured it in a way where i uh give you a brief introduction of everything uh, all the different types of habitats and species diversity we have in india and towards the end i have kept some time for interaction where i thought i could just uh, give you a glimpse of what it is to observe nature uh, or how is it uh, to spot nature or what kind of tricks and traits you need to have so to begin with because i've used the term diversity uh, i want to elaborate on what i mean when i say diversity it's short for biodiversity and biodiversity could mean three things that is particularly species biodiversity wherein we are talking about the variety of uh, flora and fauna plants animals microbes everything the sheer variety the different species that one finds on earth so this is what we call a species biodiversity for the most part of the talk when i mean diversity i i sort of mean species diversity however uh, diversity could also be spoken in terms of genetic diversity and genetic diversity is basically uh, the differences in genetic material and this could be even within the species so uh, for example uh, if you see on the uh, slide there is uh, can you see different rice varieties right so what happens here is that you have we, we have actually thousands of varieties of rice and uh, they're also different in terms of how they look how they smell how they taste because of the sheer genetic variation within that species and then also you have something called ecosystem diversity which talks about uh, locations which share a certain set of features topographical features geographical features uh, which gives it certain special features which harbor certain types of life so this is uh, the kind of diversity that i'll be talking about particularly ecosystem diversity and species diversity now having said that uh, there's interesting to also know that there are something called biodiversity hotspots in our world there are about more than 30 of them in the world and these are locations where uh, the kind of species diversity you find is immense so for example if i take a unit area and say that i find 10 species of mammals here 10 species of birds or 10 species of plants in a biodiversity hotspot one would find 30 species of birds 50 species of plants so they are densely packed in small areas and they have huge diversity in terms of species what is interesting again is that if we overlap this with the maps of rainforests of the world you'll find a lot of biodiversity hotspots are actually overlapping with the rainforests of the world and therefore these are hubs of where we find a huge variety of different kinds of flora and fauna so in terms of biodiversity hotspots india has two biodiversity hotspots uh, that is the western ghats and eastern himalayas and something interesting about biodiversity hotspots is also that they have a lot of endemic species endemic species is a term that we use when we say that this, there's a specific species that is found just in this particular region and nowhere else in the world and therefore uh, you know they also become conservation priorities so just to take an example of what might be endemic species in the western ghats we have a very interesting species of monkey called the lion tail macaque and if you look at this photo it 
you, you can see that peculiar face it has, right? The monkey. It has this lion like mane around it. Its tail is pretty short. And they're very exclusive rainforest dwellers. They have some very specific feeding habits and they're endemic to the Western Ghats. On the right, you see a Malabar gliding frog, which is this brilliantly fluorescent green color frog that you find, which can glide. Uh, it has webbing in its feet and it also gives it the ability to sort of glide from foliage to foliage. And uh, it makes these foam nests in low hanging foliage around pools. And they uh, have, and because they, they are able to glide, they are called Malabar species that is endemic to the Western Ghats. Now let's move on to uh, the, uh, specifically the Indian topography. And if you sort of look at how we are placed in the subcontinent, uh, we seem to have a whole variety of uh, uh, topography that we can see that there are mountains in the north and we have a huge coastline. So uh, given our very strategic location in the subcontinent, it has given rise to also very interesting habitats. So let's Let's take a quick run through all the different kind of habitats that we have in our country, starting with, of course, something that is the highest in altitude. And that is, of course, I don't know if any of you can guess where, what this is, but uh, though India is not uh, home to any of the major uh, high, extremely big mountains, we do share one with uh, Nepal, and that is Kanchenjunga. Uh, the peak is at around eight close to more than eight, this particular peak that you see here, uh, the one that is this one, is Kanchenjunga. And of course, as we know, at this altitude, the atmosphere is really rare. The climate is extreme, and it's very difficult for any life. Difficult in these extreme conditions for life to thrive. But the moment we come down a little bit, say even at 4, 000, uh, 5,000 meters above sea level, 6,000 meters above sea level, we find that there is a huge amount of wildlife that we can see. So for example, this particular photo that you see on the screen is that of the Baba Pass, which is a high mountain pass which connects the Kinnor Valley in Himachal Pradesh to the Spiti Valley in, also in Himachal Pradesh. And even though this looks completely filled with snow and very difficult uh, in terms of uh, how one might navigate in it, I remember that we were absolutely tired climbing this entire patch and there it was an absolutely beautiful bird right there at the top of the hill. So um, just a second. I think. So we had this uh, red fronted rose finch right there, you know, inviting us and showing itself off. This is a male red fronted rose finch. And in those freezing temperatures, we suddenly saw this whole uh, uh, avian world open up to us. And this is not just true for this particular bird. Even if we look at other high altitude places like cold deserts, where one might find such kind of places in say uh, like Leh and Ladakh, these are areas which look absolutely uh, barren uh, as you can see here, it's a cold desert, which means that there is lack of vegetation. Temperatures are extreme. Uh, the temperatures, in fact, during winters can go as low as minus 30 degrees, 40 degrees C. And there's no vegetation, as you know. So even though it's a desert, typically how we find uh, places with less precipitation, there is still a lot of wildlife that thrives here. So to give you some examples of what kind of wildlife th thrives here, on the left, you see uh, blue sheep, also, uh, you know, a very common ungulate found there. They are these very, very interesting um, uh, sheep family members who can walk on these very cliff edges and sharp edges without falling. They balance themselves so well. They're also one of the favorite preys of the snow leopard, which is also found in this region. And this is just one of the many ungulates that we find there. In the bottom, we also find the Mongolian finch. You can see there it's a small bird which has that pinkish hue. And also we can see a pug mark here, which is most likely of that of a wolf. So this region also has predators like the snow leopard 
and uh, wolves and so on. So interestingly, if you also look at the kind of wildlife that you find here, a lot of it are also very much in uh, the same uh, hue as that of the landscape. You know, you, we saw the landscape, which is also typically this pinkish, brownish hue and all the animals that, many of the animals that you find here rather are also having that kind of adaptation, which is very interesting to uh, actually observe. And so it also becomes difficult to observe these kind of animals in these uh, habitats. So moving on, now as we come a little bit lower in altitude, right? So places like Ladakh and Leh are cold deserts because they're also located at very high altitudes. But it, like, for example, the city of Leh itself is about 3000 meters above sea level. But say when we come down a little bit more in altitude, we find that uh, we have these one Aditi trees and uh, they uh, support a huge deal of uh, wildlife you know this is the place where your glaciers start melting and you have fresh forest streams emerging and uh, a lot of these forests are not just um, uh, pine forests but they can also be mixed forests rhododendron mm -hmm. forests and because these places are covered with snow uh, and a lot of wildlife that are actually in this to deal with the winter uh, temperatures. But yet one finds full and Lovely to uh, you know see on snow-capped peaks. Uh, we also find very interesting birds like the scarlet finches there. So most often we kind of see these kind of beautiful birds on TV, but uh, we actually have such kind of birds even in India. This particular photo that you see, it has two males and one female. Uh, in birds particularly, what is interesting is that they show sexual dimorphism, where the males and female look very distinct, and uh, for the most part, it's uh, okay to assume that the males will be more brightly colored. So over here, you see the right, bright red ones are males and the one in the center is the female. At that same altitude, you also have grasslands and we call these places alpine meadows. And these again uh, are absolutely... And this pink, uh, purple, and yellow uh, patch that you see here are actually flowers. And these meadows are actually one. And flowers are so exciting. So are there? I think the one, in, the purple one in the center is uh, an orchid. The one in the pink in the center is a rhododendron flower. So apart from even wildlife diversity, uh, these are also places where floral diversity is very high and they also support, you know, a very uh, elusive mammals like Himalayan brown bears and all of that. So, also called cloud forests. Uh, this particular photo is from Arunachal Pradesh and uh, it's a uh, Namdafa uh, National Park. Evergreen forests are those forests where you know the trees remain green for most of the year, they don't shed their leaves. Invariably there is a perennial stream that you might find that you know is the lifeline of the place and Sometimes when evergreen forests are located at higher altitudes, they're covered by mist and almost seeming in line with clouds. And hence, some of these are also called cloud forests. They, again, support a huge variety of life. And as I mentioned to you, uh, like uh, many of the biodiversity hotspots, among the different types of forests that are there, they support a huge deal of diversity, not just in mammals and birds, but also, say, fishes, reptiles, uh, amphibians, and so on. As we come down from the hills, you know, we slowly start hitting the sea level, uh, the lands that are where uh, 
practices start uh, in greater numbers. To take an example of what one might call plains, uh, here is a photo from Assam. And these are uh, the beautiful grasslands and flat plains of, uh, that are right by the side of river Brahmaputra. Uh, the water body that you see here is uh, Brahmaputra. And uh, it depends on uh, the nature of the river as well. For example, the Brahmaputra often uh, you know, overflows and overflows, the water overflows over the banks. And when the water receives back, you do have these patches of grass and then become, which become these specialized habitats for a variety of birds. And a side note here, I mean, even though I'm talking about uh, habitats which are natural, uh, naturally formed due to geography, uh, geographical uh, and topographical factors, I also want to make a side note of you know, agricultural lands, which are, of course, uh, places which are uh, manipulated or affected by uh, human activities. But even though these are, uh, you know, human dominated, one, these are not devoid of uh, wildlife. For example, typically in any agricultural patch, you're likely to stumble upon uh, birds like the Indian roller, which is on the left side that you see. And, you know, you'll always find one of these birds sitting on a wire next to you know, a farm, or as soon as you go to the outskirts of any city, or the bird on the right, which is the buyer weaver bird. Uh, I'm very sure all of you would have seen its bottle shaped nest. So, this is a nest still being made. And um, so, these birds are something that we see even say in the outskirts of the cities and our farmlands. So, moving on to the next habitat. These are places uh, and there is scarcity of water, vegetation is less and of course that also then would affect the kind of typically in terms of flora we would see something like various cacti grow here in the region but there's also a lot of interesting wildlife here. So for example you do have small mammals like the jerds that you know burrow into the soil and form these cool passages under the uh, earth. Where and when I mean cool, it really I mean it means looking strange and different looking lizards like the spiny tail lizard that you see on the right. Again, if you, a quick glimpse at these uh, you know animals tells you that how their color and everything for. Uh, you know, habitat, which is so extreme with so many extreme conditions. Moving on to the next kind of habitat, and these are dry deciduous forests. I think probably after evergreen forests, these are some of the most common habitats that all of you might be familiar with. In fact, a such kind of forests where uh, teak forests or sal forests and uh, they are uh, also city of wildlife but why they're also more in the limelight is because they're home to a lot of tigers and probably a lot of the safari rides or photographs that you see where we uh, people post tigers are from uh, these kind of locations but of course apart from tigers as i mentioned these places are also uh, home to a lot of other uh, wildlife. Even sloth bears live in these pangolins and many other uh, lesser known animals live in these forests. And now we come to habitats and something that I mentioned right at the beginning of the talk as well and that is rainforests. When we say rainforest, the moment we hear that word, we are in our mind thinking Amazon. Think of those regions. But India also has rainforests. And this particular photo is from Agumbe. Rapunji of the south. Uh, that's just an indication of the amount of rainfall this region can receive uh, up to 9,000 9, mm of rainfall. And rainforests, the most beautiful feature about them is that they're so densely packed. I mean, if you walk, in a rainforest, you'll find that it's, it's actually dark inside because 
there's almost no possible place where the sunlight can actually get the photo. The it's so densely packed, right? You have these very tall trees which form the top canopy, and then you'll have mid-level trees which form the next layer, and then small with a whole lot of shrubs and no space left on the forest floor and almost every part a lot of flora on the right is a very typical the forest floor might look if you put your feet on this because what happens in rainforest is that the decomposition rates are very low and you have such a thick forest you probably never see the soil because the layer of the leaves itself is and uh, it's the very nature of these spaces you know they have high humidity rain content is high there's always dampness uh, it can get misty it's dark temperatures are cool and they also support a great deal of biodiversity. And here is just but a small glimpse of the various kinds of animals that one might find, which is this really huge squirrel, which has this maroonish red fur. They love to uh, feast on the fruits and other nuts and make these giant nests also on trees. In the center, you see the Malabar trogon, which is, this is a male specimen. Uh, and uh, they are these very beautiful, quite large birds, in fact, the female looks different, uh, found in area, forested areas and also, for example, found in the Agumbe region. And, uh, you know, locally uh, common, though not. Uh, and, uh, on the right, you also find a uh, clipper butterfly which is also you know, common to forested regions. This particular specimen was clicked in the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. So as you see, it's not just mammals and birds, but also uh, you know, smaller uh, wildlife like butterflies, which are of interest and you know, which are supported by rainforest habitats. I'd like to talk about two particularly one to find in rainforests. And on the left is uh, what we call Draco, it's a gliding lizard. And what is so fascinating about the kind of folds that you see here between the limbs, uh, this, these limbs actually they open out like a flap. And this gives the ability for the lizard to actually glide and jump from tree to tree. And they can make about a jump that is almost 20 to 30 meters. So Uh, also gliding on the right of course is according to me one of the uh, reptiles that we have in our country which is the king cobra the king cobra is the longest venomous snake in the world and uh, this particular specimen that you see, this was again photographed in Agumbe, and she was about 13 feet. So you can imagine if you're sitting in your living room right now, you can imagine you can, what 13 feet is. They are really, really long. Uh, and they are known to have uh, this ability to uh, inject a high quantity of venom, unlike other snakes. There, of course, the bite is fatal to human beings, but they're very gentle creatures. And despite it, having this reputation of being the longest venomous snake in the world, one hardly finds uh, encounters, uh, you know, negative encounters of these gentle snakes with human beings. So, you know, I, I particularly wanted to you know, emphasize these two very interesting species that... So, now I'll move on to the next habitat, and that is mangroves. These again are absolutely interesting uh, landscapes and 
there are a lot of very interesting features to notice about mangroves. Mangrove forests are very specialized ecosystems in the sense that they are usually found in areas where the water is breakage or there is high salinity. Now, if you take a typical plant and we put salt water, you know, if the plant is going to die, if you keep flooding it with a lot of water, the plants cannot survive in such a place. So what is it about mangroves that helps them to survive in such extreme? For one, that, uh, you know, this particular photo that you see here is from Odisha. And uh, at this point, it's low tide, right? So the photo that you see here is when the water has actually not uh, completely flooded this place. So imagine the flooded with water then what happens, right? So these projections that you see are the breeding roots that mangroves breathe through water. And they also have the ability to tolerate very saline conditions. And because of this very special and peculiar feature of mangrove forests, they form like this buffer between sea and land and, you know, are considered as the lifeline for most coastal cities because they are the last barrier uh, which, you know, keeps the sea at bay. And the, uh, even though they have, I mean, they have such an important ecological role, no doubt, but they also support a great deal of wildlife. To give you an example, here are two very interesting reptiles that one finds in mangrove forests. Uh, on the left is the water monitor lizard, and on the right is a saltwater crocodile. Saltwater crocodiles are unlike the regular crocodiles, that is the freshwater mugger that we call. For one, they are known to be the largest living reptiles on the planet. They can, they're known to grow as large as 20 feet. So you can just imagine how big these uh, salties get. Salties are names that are colloquially given to the saltwater crocodiles. The temperament is also known to be uh, more aggressive than their cousins and they feed on very large and they, they can easily uh, feed on mammals that are much bigger uh, in terms of size when you compare it. So uh, the mangrove habitats actually support these reptiles and also uh, not to mention a range of avian life as well. So for example, the photos that you see here now are different types of kingfishers that one might find in mangrove habitats. On the left, you see the colored kingfisher. In the center, there's the brown wig kingfisher. And on the right, black cat kingfisher. Of course, uh, some of these birds are also found in other places uh, across the country, but uh, there are all, these are also specifically found around mangrove habitats. In fact, we also have another kingfisher called the ruddy kingfisher that's more or less exclusively found around mangrove habitats. So even though while I'm talking about mangroves and their very important ecological role, uh, this is another added feature about them that, you know, they support a great deal of wildlife. And I'm sure all of you have heard of the Sundarbans forest, which is a mangrove forest, and they also uh, house the Bengal tiger there. So to uh, coastal islands, um, I'm, I'm clubbing this as a category together, you know, uh, as you know that uh, India on the west have Lakshadweep Islands and on the east have uh, the Andaman and Nicobar Islands. Uh, just give you an idea, uh, the red box that you see is where we have the Great Nicobar Island, which is so far away located from the Indian mainland that is actually more close to uh, Java Sumatra region. Uh, so this is more close to Thailand and Indonesia rather than the Indian mainland. And this photo that you see is actually from uh, the Great Nicobar Island. And you are going to look absolutely picturesque turquoise waters and the beach has just not even ended and you find that a thick evergreen forest has, uh, you know, started right there at the beach. This is a very interesting part of some of the islands that we have in the tropical area. And not to mention that up till now, the kind of diversity that we've been talking about has largely been about terrestrial uh, life. But uh, these areas are also home to a variety of marine life, 
corals and other forms of marine life, like for example, sea anemones, green mussels, and many other sea cucumbers and a whole lot of it. And of course, I don't have many pictures of marine life because for that you would need different equipment. But this is just part a glimpse of what finds around uh, coastal areas and coastal islands. Uh, now moving on to another type of habitat, more in the south. These are called shola forests. And shola forests are uh, not very high altitude, but they are these forests that are located on mountains which are interspersed with grasslands, like the photo that you see here. And they're very special and they're also often called as cloud forests because of the way, uh, you know, Often one finds themselves eye to eye with a lot of mist and clouds here. And they also house a great deal of very interesting wildlife. For example, the Nilgiri Thar uh, always find themselves on these grasslands and they forage on these grasslands. On the right, you see a very interesting skink, which is also a reptile. And what is so exciting about it is that the front half is copper color, just like the forest floor. And the back end is almost electric blue and it stands out. And it's very exciting to see that. Uh, I mean, I probably cannot explain why this is so, but it's ex exciting to also see that how these forests actually support such unique wildlife. Last bit of wildlife, uh, sorry, uh, habitats. And they are particularly what we call as grasslands. Uh, which uh, typically will not have large trees, but rather small shrubs and a whole lot of grass, which one sees more often in post monsoon times. And the thorn forests, scrublands, and of course, uh, something that we'll see after this also, which we call wetlands or salt pans. Now, the problem with these. Uh, kind of habitats is that there is a misconception that these are wastelands or they're barren and they end up being projects of afforestation. So when one wants to, or places of so-called development, quote unquote development, because since there are no trees here, one views these as wastelands and therefore not uh, able to support a whole deal of wildlife. But that's not true. These are unique for, uh, habitats and they also support a fair share of their own habitats. Like this is the Indian eagle out on the left, Indian fox on the right, uh, and a whole lot of scavengers that you might find in these areas. So it's a very common misconception that these habitats actually don't support wildlife, but it's absolutely untrue. This is also true for wetlands and salt pans. This is from the Great Run of Kutch. As you know, we have extensive salt pans in this area and uh, a lot of actually development projects are coming up in the area but they've also been affecting the wildlife in this area and they're not barren they're actually teeming with a lot of life uh, we have monitor lizard here jackals blue sheep beater and a whole lot of other wildlife that we can find here So now that we have sort of seen uh, you know, the kind of habitats that we find in the country, uh, I also wanted to direct your attention to the lesser known fauna. I mean, we all are aware of tigers and lions and elephants, all of it that gets the glamour and uh, a lot of footage on television. But I also wanted to share with you some very interesting uh, fauna, which perhaps some of us may not have seen. Uh, so, for example, uh, you know, perhaps some of you would like to guess what this might be. Can anyone take a guess? What does this look like? What does this seem that this might be? Looks like a leaf to me. I don't know. Okay, looks like a leaf. That's one definitely. What else 
uh, might it remind you of? Uh, maybe an eel. Okay, eel definitely. So snake like slug. Snake, something like a slug, something like a snake. So very interestingly, I mean, of course, when we see this for the first time, these are uh, what comes across to us as well. You know, the structure, the way it looks. But interestingly, this is what we call a Sicilian. A Sicilian is actually a legless amphibian. And when I mean amphibian, I'm actually uh, talking about an organism that is more closely related to frogs and toads. And even though this definitely looks something like a snake or an earthworm or a slug or something, it's a very interesting uh, species that comes up mostly during monsoons because they live underground for the most part. And I know uh, India has a huge number of species when it comes to Sicilians, many of which are endemic. Uh, then we also have lesser fauna like dragonflies and things. I mean, often, I guess, when we go to the forest, we pay little attention to the insects. And India also has a huge diversity of dragonflies. This is the blue darner, which is quite a big dragonfly, which uh, we find near forested areas. The one on the left is the male. The blue one is the male. The green one is female. And then we also have moths. So I know that butterflies definitely get a lot of attention because they're colorful and uh, you know we find them during the day. But I think moths are also very extreme. Moth called the owlet moth, and they have these psychedelic patterns on their wings and the presence of owl-like eyes on the wings, you know, which is a way to uh, evade predators. And then you have something like a pill millipede. On the left, you see that that's how the pill millipede, pill millipede looks it's on the forest floor. And the moment it feels threatened, it rolls up into this ball. And this ball Hello? Hello, there's please? some disturbance. Yeah, yeah. Participants, please mute your video audio. Yes, I think you can continue. Yeah. So Sorry. the pill, no problem. So the pill millipede is something that's really uh, fun to watch because you know they're found on the forest floor. They are one of a very important part of the decomposition process. And the moment they feel threatened, uh, you find that they roll up into this ball and they are they become impenetrable. You know, they become so hard and you and unless they feel that they're uh, they are not threatened anymore, they don't actually open up and start moving again. So we have this whole range of wildlife that probably we are not paying attention to. And uh, uh, one of the things I did want to communicate to all of you is that wildlife and diversity that we see around us is definitely beyond all the megafauna that is the ones that often get the attention like the lions and tigers, but also there's all of these, another world open up for us you know, in terms of insects, uh, reptiles and amphibians that we definitely uh, can learn a lot from. Uh, the last part that I would like to share Aditi, uh, we cannot see your screen. Okay, great. So uh, up till now, we saw a variety of habitats uh, across the country. And uh, one of the points, as I mentioned before, was that uh, wildlife definitely goes beyond the uh, typical megafauna that we have talked about. And there are all these little other uh, world of insects and butterflies and dragonflies, amphibians, uh, fishes also. Of course, I'm not even covered fishes, but there's a whole lot of other the other thing that I wanted to communicate was also that, you know, wildlife doesn't always have to be something that you see uh, in uh, or where you have to go to a forest and uh, observe it. You know, sometimes you can just see it right in your own backyard. 
So that way we have been very lucky because Mumbai is home to a full range of habitats on its own. We know we have uh, our coastline lined with mangroves. We have, have of course, a coastline and of course, a national park, a forested area right in the middle of the city, which uh, also houses Uh, Aditi, uh, you're not audible. Your own window. These are some birds. Uh, we can definitely. Within city limits and, uh, you know, just a little bit. Uh, you know, if we close our eyes, I'm sure if not see them, we will surely hear them. Uh, this is also something that, uh, you know, I had cited just outside my office one day. This is a spectacle cobra feeding on a toad. And uh, what's interesting is that right in the middle of the city, you know, we all know how things work, how nature has its food cycles and food webs in place. Uh, these kind of things are happening all around us. We are seeing this spectacle cobra actually feeding on a toad. We can't uh, not forget the kind of uh, all of us in the urban biodiversity, which we often tend to miss because bad sun or something perhaps where our attention actually goes to uh, and was like in turn keep the snake population in check so we have all this urban biodiversity all of these photos in fact are been clicked uh, you know in this part of the city and i'm very sure that if all of you take some time out we can definitely observe some of these aspects of wildlife in the city as well and lastly as i mentioned that not just focus on the big ones but also the little ones like spiders and moths uh, all of this again uh, very commonly found in the city so you know during specific seasons we are likely to stumble upon them some more so every time you take a walk in your own backyard uh, very sure that you know we can start observing the diversity from our own cities and of course uh, explore elsewhere. On that front, I, uh, since you know, in, in keeping the interest of the time, I would like to, uh, you know, just quickly mention this particular website. And I would really like if all of you can go check it out. It's a website that we developed at our center along with my colleague Ravi, uh, Ravi Sinha. Uh, it's a compilation of all the common birds that we find in the city. And the moment you on it and uh, hover your mouse around it, the call of the bird actually comes. So that way uh, you can sort of um, keep, uh, you know, make a correlation between which bird makes which call. And I'm pretty sure once you listen to the calls of the birds, you'll actually realize that you've been hearing a lot of these sounds, you know, in the afternoons or even in the mornings and evenings. So I put this link in the chat box after my presentation is done. Um, so I sort of end my talk here. But uh, do we have any time? I uh, can you just let me know? Yes. All right. So then I just uh, have a little two minutes more of a little fun uh, with all of you. Uh, you know, I thought that uh, we've been talking about how a lot of wildlife, uh, you know, are adapted to certain places and uh, also sport colors, which are. Uh, part of that, which make it almost camouflage and it's difficult to spot them. So when you're out there spotting wildlife, it sometimes can be tricky and you might need a lot of patience and a lot of, uh, you know, sense of keen observation. So I'm sharing a photo, uh, the, uh, the next photo with you, and I would like you all to tell me what wildlife you see in this photo. So you can unmute yourself or maybe put it up in the chat box. What is it that you see here? The 
someone mentioning anything in uh, yes we have got uh, two answers green wine snake green wine okay. snake by rutuja okay because, sir and a green snake by rtm okay so yeah i think you have spotted it if for those who haven't spotted it here if you look closely from all the way to the left the entire screen almost there is a snake that is located here and this is very typical of the green wine snake i think rutuja also has got the name of the snake uh, right they are found in mid level foliage and when you're say probably walking down a forest while this might seem easy to spot it's not so easy when you're out there on field trying to spot you know birds or reptiles so this is a uh, one thing let's take a look at another one this is the great run of kutch uh, and i remember uh, we were in the vehicle and our guide stopped and said oh here they are and you know all of us were staring at this place for 2 minutes before we realized that there was quite a bit of things to watch here i think there are some responses in the chat if yes uh we have sand grouse by uh, uh by manik gadi ma'am then we have yellow birds by tejaswini and so would you also yeah Fez okay so by rita ma'am okay some birds by shakti shivaram and are there yeah, brown quail sort of birds by rtm okay great so i think all of you managed to spot some birds and they seem to be merging with the kind of stones that you find there so there are in fact three birds here these are sand grouses painted sand grouses two males and one female and uh, of course they sort of almost merge with the stones that you find here and unless they move it's actually very difficult to spot them so this is how uh, it's it's sort of fun when you are actually out there so let's do this last one before i uh, Uh, close the presentation what is it that you can see here uh, i can see a moth i think okay all right uh wh where exactly can you see the moth can you also give the location at the bottom left Okay, yeah, great. Okay, so here, okay, someone's definitely spotted a moth here. Very correct. Well, uh, something else also, perhaps. Uh, there's a viper snake on the top right. Top right, right. So I think we have spotted both. So there is a Malabar pit viper here, and we have also a moth here. So you've spotted both of them. So yes, yeah, so this is basically to you know give you a glimpse of. Uh, how fun it can be also but it can also be frustrating when we don't spot uh, you know a lot of wildlife but this is a butterfly here so i'll stop here because we are also crossing our time so thank you for uh, you know uh, once again for your time on this weekend i i apologize for the technical difficulties that we had in between uh, but i hope uh, uh, you know i was able to communicate uh, what i wanted to and uh, I'd be happy to hear from you your experiences. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Aditi, for the amazing 